Platz ist. Critical Race Theory, Book Bans, Mask Policies, just a few of the issues that have bogged down education in the Gem State lately. But those pale in comparison to a much bigger issue, a lack of teachers and a lack of money to pay them. A solution, one group says, could be decided by Idahoans directly. Well, we are in the middle of an election lull, so of course, yep, bring on the stale claims of voter fraud. What the pillow guy is saying now about Idaho's primary election and what he's going to do about it. Boise is known as the city of trees, not the city of trees that live forever. It's the end of an era for one maple that's made its home here since nearly the beginning of Boise. The latest issues facing public education in Idaho, we're talking about critical race theory, banning of books, mask mandates to help stop the spread of deadly virus, are all just that, the latest. And they've certainly played a part in another problem facing Idaho schools, and another that has been around a lot longer. The ongoing and increasing teacher shortage and lack of funding to pay them. One grassroots nonprofit organization says they have the solution, though. And they say their ballot initiative could raise more than $320 million for Idaho's public schools. And they want to do it by adding another income tax bracket. Here's Andrew Bartline. Vote. Yes. Vote. Yes. The tread on yes. these tires aren't measured with miles. They're measured in signatures. These things should be funded. Our legislators are not doing what they need to do. Backpacks from 20 different Idaho counties line the state house steps, representing 100,000 Idahoans, all in support of Reclaim Idaho's Quality Education Act. This isn't going to solve all the problems in public schools, but it's a good start because we have been going down since I started. Leah Jones signed the petition. She's a second grade teacher in the Twin Falls School District. I love seeing them grow. I love seeing them learn. I love the aha moments. But those special moments in the classroom have become overshadowed by low wages, staffing shortages, and stress to fill in the gaps. These are all problems Jones attributes to the state. So I won't leave the state. I'm going to stay with my family. But I have thought about leaving the profession and going to a different profession just because I'm so tired. Specifically, Jones is tired of last place. According to the National Education Association, Idaho spends less than $9,000 a year on each student. Utah is the only other state spending less than 10000 These kids need so much, so much more than what we're doing, than what we can give. We need more help. The Quality Education Act aims to collect more than $320 million annually for Idaho public schools. The initiative would create a new tax bracket for any person earning more than a quarter million dollars a year or a married couple earning more than half a million dollars. Each dollar earned above this threshold would be taxed at nearly 11 percent. We just have a legislature that is absolutely not doing its job with education. Gary Moultonen is a small business owner in Caldwell. He supports the initiative even though it would also raise the business tax from 6 percent to 8%. He says educated workers are needed now more than ever, where his company is often on the hook for helping entry-level employees finish high school or even consider further education. If you take pride in being last in the nation, then keep that attitude. If you'd like to see Idaho climb up in the ranks, then you need to be willing to pay more taxes. End of story. So Jones and Moulton in line the state house halls and helped this uniform group of citizen lawmakers hand deliver the signatures directly to the Idaho Secretary of State's office for verification. If 65,000 confirmed signatures represent 6% of 18 legislative districts, this initiative will roll its way onto the November ballot. It's really simple. We need educated workers. An initiative needs 50% plus one vote to become state law. And the outcome of this vote could be the deciding factor for Leah Jones and other educators. And I just can't anymore. And there'll be more like me leaving if nothing changes. And they'll Reclaim Idaho co-founder Luke Mavel says the counties have confirmed these signatures. That was in the backpacks to make that clear. Now the state just needs to do the same. So his team is very confident over at Reclaim Idaho that this will be on the ballot come November. And while there was a lot of talk about people being upset with lawmakers, Brian, mm -hmm. saying that the state house or lawmakers at the state house aren't doing anything to help education, there have been some steps forward. We know yep. that there was a recent house bill that the governor signed that 
provided some money for K through 12 early literacy programs. There has been progress made. It's just they feel it's not enough. And as we heard from a teacher today, she says it's not enough from her own experience. And now we're wrapping up this fiscal year with an even bigger surplus in Idaho's coffers. And so I'm sure a lot of people calling for that money to be kind of shifted over toward education as well. Yep. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would like that, but we'll see what happens with the legislative session. They're looking to do it by uh, increasing some, some income taxes on top wage earners. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. We'll keep an eye on this as we get into November. Well, before we even get to that November general election, apparently we're still having to deal with last May's primary election, or at least some people would like us to. Specifically, Mike Lindell, the pillow guy, who has feathered himself into election integrity issues across the country. Well, yesterday, political commentator Ron Filipowski, or Filipkowski, excuse me, tweeted my pillow CEO Mike Lindell's opening an investigation into Janice McGeehan's loss in the Republican primary for Idaho governor. He said as much, Lindell did, on his web show called the Lindell Report. And during yesterday's episode, he got a call from Connor in Idaho. Do you have eyes, or did you have eyes perhaps on Idaho's primary for governor? I know. Trump endorsed Janice, uh, I think Meachin is how you say her last name. Uh, she lost to the petty tyrant Brad Little to like an eight to one ratio. And I haven't talked to one person that said they voted for Brad Little. Mm, not one person. Well, apparently Connor has seemed to avoid the 148,213 Idahoans who did vote for Governor Little. And it's McGeehan, by the way. It's a race little one with 53% of the vote to Lieutenant Governor McGeehan's 32%. 53 to 32, not exactly an 8 to 1 margin. Not that facts seem to be Connor's forte. Connor claims to be from a small county, which he didn't say, though. He did say he didn't want to put his ballot into a machine when he voted in the primary, which he also couldn't remember what day it was. Lindell's response? Well, at first he laughed at Idaho for sending him a bill over his last batch of bogus claims of widespread voter fraud in the Gem State. But he also said... He has a team here in Idaho looking into it, and he added this nugget. Don't sit and say there's no evidence when it's piled all the way to the, all the, way to the sun and back, right here on Frank's speech. Go down and click on bombshell evidence. Click on any one of the preliminary injunctions. And I will, tell, I will promise you this, Idaho, um, you're gonna, you're, we are not letting this uh, sit idly by. You're going to be represented at the 20, 20, at the big August 20th, um, the Moment of Truth Summit, and there will be and there will be representation there from Idaho. And all of this stuff is not happening in vain. All of these people with the machines will be melted down and used for prison bars. And it, and uh, Idaho is at the front of the line, as far as I'm concerned. At the front of the line in a state where these machines he claims to use, we just don't use. Idaho state officials looked into Lindell's earlier allegations, by the way. None of them turned out to be true. In fact, seven counties Lindell said had voting machines issues. They didn't even use any electronic voting processes at all. The state of Idaho sent Lindell a bill for $6,000 and sent him a cease and desist letter as well, demanding he stop with all the big lies about Idaho's elections. As you can see, that hasn't really worked out so well. So we spoke with Chief Deputy Secretary of State Chad Houck today about this, and he told us, yeah, he's seen that video clip. And as far as he knows, Lindell's claims are once again baseless. Adding, though, if Lindell has any evidence to back these claims up, bring them forward. They will look into them. Till then, I guess we'll have to wait and see if that moment of truth summit will feature any matter of truth. The oldest tree on Earth. It's been around since about the time the ancient Egyptians were building the pyramids, which is nearly 5,000 years ago, or more than 5,000 years ago, because there's some argument as to which tree is actually the oldest, the one in California or the one down in Chile. But it doesn't really matter because those multi-millennia landmarks don't really have much to do with this story other than, well, they're trees, and trees can grow very old. As you can imagine, there are a few old ones in Boise. Mind you, not dating back thousands of years, but almost as old as the city itself. They've been around nearly half a century, or a century and a half, I should say. Today, one of those relics was removed from the front of one of the oldest buildings in Idaho. Removing a tree from a city full of them is rarely considered a big deal. No, no. Other than by those who walk by it regularly. 
Every day. Wow. Seven days a week. However, arborists have had an eye on this tree for a while. The tree's just become a, a hazard to the main street here. It's diseased and dying. And recently, a branch broke off, breaking a section of fence. Well, and if they're sick, then, it, you know, then they're a danger. They're a danger. So it's got to go. That's what they wanted to do today. Nearly a dozen from Dunright Tree Company will dissect this silver maple piece by piece. Trees have a life just like all of us. But this tree has had a much longer life, one rooted in Boise's beginnings. When native people were here and then Euro-American settlement began, there was just a row of cottonwoods and willows along the river. So Euro-American settlers introduced everything that we see that's not a willow or a cottonwood tree. Boise was founded in 1863. And shortly after, because the settlement of Idaho was spurred by the discovery of gold, the Assay Office became the first federal building in the Idaho Territory. It was built because miners needed a place where they could, um, they could get an official government sort of certificate that, that told them or potential investors about the value of their minerals. The closest place that you could go if you weren't coming to Boise City after 1872 was San Francisco or Denver. So this was a very important building and built here strategically by the U.S. Treasury Department to serve the miners in Idaho Territory. It opened in 1872. Makes it 150 years old this year. And Boiseans wasted little time trying to spruce and silver maple it up a bit. Because this was, in essence, the first public park in the city, and, and they were beautifying these public grounds. And these trees that we have here on this site um, are likely some of the oldest, most mature uh, trees in the city. But since nobody actually wrote down when things were planted, their exact age is just a best guess. We have photographs that, that show it, we think, probably in the early 1890s. So that makes this silver maple about 130 years old. A legacy about to be lopped off in mere minutes. About an hour and a half. And rightfully so, since it's rotting. But it's a healthy hack at some of Boise's history. Is some of the history being lost in the removal of that tree? Absolutely. Uh, Idaho history, Boise history, has all, um, has all been seen by that particular tree. I know. Yeah. Think about what Main Street used to look like back when that tree was just a little guy. So it kills me when they have to take one of these down. It really does. Sure, several other trees have come and gone before, and several others will follow, since time comes for us all. It does indeed. But it's still a big deal when it does. When you look at these trees, it makes you feel really insignificant. You know, it's like, whoa, you know. Well, the SA office is now the home of the State Historic Preservation Office. Dan Everhart, the historian we spoke with who works there, says they're not removing the historic landscape entirely, just, you know, one element of it and maybe a few other elements. There's a couple of other silver maples that are nearing the end of their lifespan, but they do plan to replace them by planting as many as a dozen new trees, so a lot more. And it's part of the renovation project of the park. They're going to be adding some new features, including an interpretive pathway around the outside of the property. There'll be plaques added that will tell the story of the building and the site. There's plans for benches, too, so you can sit there and just kind of relax a bit. And they're spending about $300,000 on landscaping upgrades alone this year, all paid for through private donations, corporate sponsorships, and matching funds from the Capital City Development Corporation. They're still raising money, by the way, and they'd be happy to have your help. We will include a link how you can do that in this story at ktvb.com. Speed. It's the rate at which something is able to move or operate. Well, when it comes to a 1976 pickup, speed generally isn't considered. Well, how about we hit 88 miles on the old speedometer and go back a couple of decades? A redial about how fast a 76 truck can go. Faster than the rest. All right, now quickly get to your phones and join the 208 conversation. Here's the number you can use, 208-321-5614. Text us with any questions or comments you have about the show, but don't forget to include your name and the hashtag, the 208. That number also works for a voicemail if you'd like to leave us those because you know how much we love those. But stick around because we could share your text message at the end of today's show.
I feel the need, the need for speed. Oh yeah, it's a classic line from the 1986 hit film Top Gun that obviously comes back to mind when you think of the one that came out this summer as well. It's talking about speed and records and all that kind of stuff. We were combing through the KTVB archives. We didn't have to dig that far back to find another speed demon. Not Maverick, but somebody a little closer to the ground. Back in 2000, John Phillips of Middleton set out to set a record for the fastest land speed in a pickup truck. He tried to do it at the Bonneville Salt Flats in Wendover, Utah. At the time, there was no record for pickups. Like, nobody ever did it. And as former Idaho Life reporter John Miller found out, Phillips' 1976 club cab, well, might have just settled the score on speed. <laughs> At a glance, you'd think John Phillips' 1976 Dodge Club Cab Adventurer could break down at any moment. But the fact is, it's about to break a land speed record. If you ask him why, why not? I've always been fascinated with land speed as uh, a form of racing, mm -hmm. and I'm not getting any younger. I thought I'd give it a try. And without the luxury of a high-performance rocket car, John decided to soup up his old pickup. So what's the current record? There is no current record. Nobody's run that particular class yet. Well, there you go, huh? You see, no one's ever run a production class pickup across Utah's Bonneville Salt Flats. So if John can go down there and manage one mile an hour, he'll have the land speed record in a pickup truck. How fast can it go? We don't have any idea yet. There's no place around here to try it out. Can't do it on a drag strip? Drag strips are too short. And the airport runway? They're too short. Though John's positive he can do 125 miles per hour in first gear. That's hauling the groceries. And with 417 horses under that hood. So you can get home before the ice cream melts. And naturally, your wife thinks you're crazy? Absolutely. Kids think you're crazy? Oh, yeah. Neighbors think you're crazy? The neighbors don't know what to think. There goes John in his 1976 Dodge Salt Flats record holding thing. Hopefully. And hopefully, John says, the old Dodge will top 150, which we can only imagine will look something like this. Keep your fingers crossed. And we'll see you on down the road, huh? Absolutely. John Miller, Idaho's News Channel 7. Oh, he did break that 150. In fact, in August of 2000, at the Bonneville Salt Flats, Phillips set the very first land speed record for the C-Class production pickup category. From 2000 to 2004, he broke and set that record in that category. Now, we tried to find out uh, what those specific records were, uh, from the Bonneville racing uh, area was, what those were, but we haven't heard back yet. So, sadly, we have to also let you know that Phillips passed away in October of 2012, 10 years ago. But as John mentioned in the story, you couldn't tr test his truck out at places like Firebird Raceway or Airport Runway. They're much too short. Bonneville Salt Flats, 12 miles long, 5 miles wide. And if you're wondering, the current record held by Jay Webb right now at 185 miles an hour, which was set back in 2009.
see some of the clouds moving through the area, but nothing happening here in the valley so far. But this is the latest radar, as you can see, moving up towards Salmon and in western Montana. My eyes are what's just to our south because that's what's moving in from the southwest to the northeast. And so far, quite a bit of this breaking up along some of those foothills as it tries to move down into the valley. Uh, more of the thunderstorms are here to our south, so Mountain Home, here's that again. It's going to be moving into your area, but you notice western Montana, that's where the big storms are. Big, strong storms, uh, hail, rain, as well as gusty winds. Most of the southwest is dry at this point, but this unsettled weather continues till maybe early afternoon for tomorrow before it dries up for the weekend. So as we look at the seven day forecast, tomorrow we hit another day where we get pretty close to the mid 90s. Again on Friday, get a little cooling at Saturday and Sunday. In fact, Sunday might be up to about 91 degrees, which is about what we have outside right now. And then when you get into Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, especially Tuesday and Wednesday, that's where the temperatures start heating up. Just to let you know, as we isolate the mornings, mornings are going to cool off into the 60s up until about Monday morning. Then they start to rise. You can see that they are warming up as we get into Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Let me show you the same temperature trend for the high temperatures. And we remain into some of those 90s to lower 90s. But then Monday is the key day. We see temperatures coming up. And as you can see, whoa, those are some triple digits. Back with more in just a moment. Final moments of the show. Let's get to your comments here. I am so sick and tired of these blowhards spouting off that Idaho is Trump land. I'm a third generation Idahoan, lifelong Republican. I'm in the middle stream Republican. But those with the microphone seem to forget we are not all right wing nut jobs, says Shauna from Nampa. This one is kind of sent in from Ed Meridian. Ironic that Idaho ranks second to last in educational spending, and an Idaho caller to the My Pillow guy can't pronounce names properly and seems to be guide challenged when it comes to math. Coincidence? I think not. 
This one, great story on education in Idaho. I quit teaching after three and a half years, in part because the attitude projected toward teachers and education. Had a school board member tell me teachers teach because they can't do anything, so I quit. Spent 30 years flying jets for the Air Force and Northwest and Delta Airlines. My advice to teachers in Idaho today, quit or move. The sooner or better, says John in Boise, and that was a long time ago. We passed term limits a few years ago. The legislators vetoed it the next year, says Ken and Donnelly. Actually, it was passed in 1994, and... It was a voter approved three years in a row after that, but in 2002, the Idaho legislature overturned that term limit that was passed by Idaho voters. Brian, the emphasis is on the ass, not the say, as when I say, you know, I was going to put that on my business card, but I was told I couldn't. We'll see you tomorrow.